Hello, welcome everyone to the Unlocking Unstoppable Love podcast. I am your host, Sacred Walker, founding CEO and Chief Medical Officer of Kumba Health International Coaching Institute and pioneer of this podcast today. We have a special treat for your heart-centered creatives and highly powerful executives that will be joining and tuning in. I'm so excited. So make sure that so that you can continue to get these dynamic podcasts. You subscribe below, you click in, you connect, you tune in because I have an amazing, amazing guest. Today, we will be talking about the powerful subject of how do you launch a lifestyle that you are, forgive me, I'm so excited that I'm stumbling across the words, okay? I want to talk about how we can launch a lifestyle that you love, where your worth is seen and valued without being perfect. And how many of us know, raise your hand right now, if you oftentimes allow perfectionism and procrastination to get in the way to, you know, really block how you manifest your gifts. Today, we have the amazing Aisha DeBerry joining us today, native of Jackson, Mississippi. She received her bachelor's of science and economics and political science from Northeastern University in Boston, Mass. Shout out to those who are East Coasters here joining today. She started a career in administration and in her alma mater based in Atlanta, and she continued through the Philadelphia College of Osteopathic Medicine, focusing in on diversity in areas of enrollment and retention, right? She was able to really manifest her gifts. She received her judicial doctorate from Lincoln Memorial University, where she was served as the president and sub-region director of the Black Law Student Association, pioneering and prominent and the Women's Law Association, Immigration Law Society, and Outlaw, an organization committed to supporting LGBTQIA communities. And as we all know here, as someone who is LGBTQ and a leader in that community, I'm so proud and excited for us joining today and having you on board. So I just wanna make sure that we're super clear. Aisha has manifested her gifts. She has manifested her gifts. She has pioneered in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and now is a manager of Gas South. And she's on many boards, including the advisory board and diversity council locally and nationally. All right. And so if you want to plug in and tune in and peek on over for a moment at AishaDBerry.com and come on back, know that that is where you can connect with her. But today we're going to be talking about how she was able to pour that into her gifts and how you can too. So we're gonna go ahead and get started because I wanna talk from one visionary to another, how you can manifest your vision and not let anything block you. So Aisha, thank you for joining us today. Absolutely, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm about to jump out of my seat. I'm so excited. Uh, This is, you know, a topic that I love talking about. And as you were reading my bio, I'm like, what, who is this woman? What what has she done, you know? And it's it's interesting because I feel like I've only been on this earth a short time. Um, So I'm excited to be able to now live in my purpose. Um, It it has really been um, life changing for me. Absolutely, absolutely. And and through so much of what's been happening this year where we had time to go inward, we got a chance to really look at what is our purpose? right? And what are some of the ways that sometimes our purpose can be pulled if we feel like we have to be at a certain place to be able to manifest. So we want to really talk about how it is that you bring your gifts out. And in the time period that you've been on the planet and the 40 plus years that I've been on the planet, how we can make some power moves, right? How we can really make some power moves. So before we go ahead and dive in, in honor of the diverse and culturally rich African diaspora that we move with, I just want to go ahead and start today with setting some intention. I'm going to do a brief honoring of our ancestors, all right, so that we can really take a moment to land. So wherever you are right now, whether you are walking down the street, whether you're in the boardroom or peeking in from the bedroom, I want you to just take a moment to just center in, and I want to call us to call in your mind's eye the names of those who have come before you, whether they are related or whether they are individuals who have pioneered your path, your purpose, because you are the answer to your ancestors' prayers. So right now, I'm going to take a moment of silence that you within your heart, in your mind, that you can call in those names for the next 30 seconds, starting now. Thank you. 
right? Beautiful, beautiful. So from the north, the south, the east, the west, I just call them in to just hold space for us so that when we manifest the worth that we have in the world, we know that they have our backs to make that happen. So let's go ahead and unlock some um, unstoppable love. Will we, Aisha? Yes, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. So, you know, I was so inspired by the movie Brown Sugar, where she, every time she opens up an interview, she says, what is the first time you fell in love with hip hop? And so we're going to start a little bit off with that. Okay. We're going to use a spinoff of Brown Sugar, bring some sweetness into this love medicine tea this morning, if you will. All right. So I want to ask you, Aisha, what is the first time that you fell in love with, with your gift right, of bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion um, into spaces to have, you know, really courageous conversations? Oh my gosh, that's such a good question, you know, sacred as I'm thinking. And I think one of the moments for me when I fell in love with the gift is when I really was pushing forward at the medical college where I was working for and noticed that there was a huge, um, I guess, inequity of people of color, uh, in particular, black and brown folks, black and brown students being able to have access to medical school. And I found myself just being extremely passionate about it. I mean, outside of just developing a recruitment plan, I was spending weekends and nights going to churches and community organizations saying, you can do this. You can, you can go to medical school. It is not about you know, what you may hear out here in these streets. You have the aptitude, you have the, inf the information now that I'm giving it to you. It's all about you having access to resources and how can I help you get there? And to see that work that I put into that come back in fruition where now friends of mine that I recruited are now dear friends who are black and brown folks who are physicians caring for their communities, caring for me even. I have a doctor I'm going to see later on today that I help bring into the program. That for me to be able to see your fruits of your labor in real time is something else. And that really sparked me and I think catapulted me into what I'm doing today because I was able to see how that one intentional act or a series of them really brought forth what we want to see, what we talk about when we talk about health equity, when we talk about wanting to see physicians or people in um, you know, these leadership roles that look like us. So that's really, I think, one of the moments for me when I really fell in love with the gifts to be able to see the reaction and the fruit of that gift. Um, yeah, I think that was the first moment. That's powerful. That's powerful. And what I love about what you're speaking into is how we move up and pull others up when we see a gap, right? Yeah. And what more of that is not the spirit of an entrepreneur to yeah. be able to say, I see what's missing and I want to be able to meet that based on the gift that I have and pulling others up, you know, as we go along. You know, yeah. that reminds me of a time that I was sitting in a psychology class over at Columbia. I was sitting in the class and I remember hearing who we were preparing to be studying. And every single person that they had presented was a person who was not of color and not of African descent. And I had come up out of Mega Ever. So I had learned about all these dy dynamic psychologists who were pioneers in the field coming out of Egypt and so forth and so on. Yes, you remember yes. approaching the professor and she said to me, if you can find one, I will include it into the curriculum. And so I remember bringing her 10. And so she said, well, that's actually too soon to incorporate this into the curriculum. So actually we won't be doing that. And now years later, I'm now on this black caucus that's looking at how do we infuse these, these languages, these lessons, these tools, so we can know that we can see our voices in spaces that have not always historically been that, right? That I can, I can be the one that says, okay, actually this curriculum now has to include diversified voices. So that was a, a moment where I fell in love with how healing can be diversified, yeah. right? This, you know, when we have multiple people who are writing the story. So I want to know from you, you know, what is a moment where something was unlocked in you? Something that was unlocked in you that made you realize I can now be the love medicine the world needs, right? That there was something that you had moved through that helped you to see this is your calling or maybe something that made you see, okay, you know what? I can become an expert in this area based on this experience. Yeah, I mean, you know, being a, a girl, a black little girl from, you know, born in Memphis, Tennessee and raised in Jackson, Mississippi, you know, you can already imagine what the... Um, 
what the expectations were of me, you know, or, or who I was. Um, and so I found myself sacred, you know, at a very young age, um, questioning my, my gender, my, uh, my race, my education. Um, but I thank God and I thank my ancestors for having parents who were very much involved and were intentional about being in the community and being involved in the community and saying, your hair is beautiful, you're smart, you're intelligent, teaching me about my ancestors, teaching me about Megra Evers from Jackson, Mississippi, right? Teaching me about Ida B. Wells and Fannie Lou Hamer and Ella Baker, teaching me about all of those women who came before me. Um, and so, you know, I, I had some struggles. I really did. I, I will say one of the major ones that I had to be honest with you is when I left Mississippi and went to Boston and was one of only in many of the classroom experiences. And so there were a lot of assumptions made about me. Um, I struggled academically just because of where I came from. And that's a whole nother podcast about education and access. Um, but I realized that at times when I spoke up or spoke out about something that wasn't right, I generally had someone behind me or coming to me and saying, thank you. Um, thank you for saying that, or thank you for speaking up, even though I was sweating, nervous, you know, didn't know what the outcome was going to be. And that's not just in college, that was in law school, that was in many of the jobs that I've had until now. I realized that I'm not just speaking on my hurt um, or my um, discredit or my uncomfortable situation. I'm also speaking on other people that are having that same experience, maybe not exactly, but some form of that. And so I always use that um, now when I get nervous or when I feel like, who should I say this right now? I don't know what the outcome's going to be. I just channel Ida B and Fannie Lou and Ella, I channel those people when I make those statements because I know what I'm saying now is going to be a lifetime change for someone in the future. It's not just about me in that in that present moment. Absolutely. So, you know, just to build on that, what I'm hearing you say is that you are consistently and you were poured into and consistently surrounded by those who have inspired. If they can make it, I can make it too. Absolutely. Right? And they were able to show up, as I like to say, in perfectly, perfectly fabulous, right? Mm -hmm. That through so much struggle of not oftentimes seeing how they can find a seat at the table, right? But they oftentimes had to build a new table to get there collectively, yeah. right? And so that's what I'm hearing you speak into. And, you know, I want to build a little bit more on what this looks like you know, when we begin to talk about perfectionism and showing up and the history of perfectionism. And I know for me as a young girl, um, when I first immigrated here from Jamaica, I remember getting a perm. Yeah. And I remember sitting in this chair mm -hmm. in the sixth grade and being told to just sit and just allow it to, to marinate. And my hair didn't take. Some people's hair took, mine did not take. And I remember it burning my scalp so badly that I actually got scabs. Yeah. And I remember, you know, my mom coming down and saying never again. And she kind of went through this process about what that would look like for me. Yeah. And so in moving forward, I ended up having to begin to have a different healing relationship with what perfection meant for me as a young Jamaican woman coming here. And how do I find space? Because there was so much conflict and wrestle around having locks in the Caribbean. Mm -hmm. You know, so much wrestle about what it meant to have locks and are you clean and are you this, all the stereotypes projected as an executive, can you be someone who is natural? Can you be someone who has a perm? Can you be someone who shows up as whatever beautiful looks like for you without feeling like literally it's going to burn you, right? And so that process was healing. And so I'm just curious about what communities have defined you? I know you've talked about moving from the South to Boston, you know, what communities have defined you that helped you to say, you know what, I can see my worth. Yeah, yeah. I can I, see my worth so I can model that for others. Oh, yeah. I, you know, I, I know there's a lot of <clears throat> folks that have varying opinions about the Black church. Mm -hmm. But I can truly say that my foundation of just love, unconditional love, support, um, exposure, for me, 
came from the black church. I, I grew up as a Christian Methodist and, you know, education is a foundation. Now, again, I know we don't get it all right. And so I'm not in any way saying that the black church is perfect, but for me, it allowed me the opportunity to explore, to ask questions. I was able to see folks from various ages, people my age, and the, the whole process of, it, of respecting my elders and learning so much from them. Um, I spent weekends and nights, you know, with programs and, and Bible studies and dances. So, I mean, that was really my foundation. And I've always had that connection with the Black church. And I know, again, there are some things that still need to be talked about um, in regards to the Black church, but it truly has been, I, I believe, over the course of just our Black experience here on this land, that the Black church has been a source um, of safety, of support of love, um, of leadership. And so that was one big one for me. And then as I've gone along my life, I found myself developing sister circles. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in high school, it was a group of us called the Divas. And then when I got to college, we had a group called Assorted Flavors. And now I'm in a, a group called Sister Care Alliance. And at the time, I didn't really know yet, you know, in the early 90s, what the word self-care was. But now it's evolving and it makes sense for me because it was a place where, you know, you go and you lay down your hair and you're like, look, this is what happened to me today, girl. Let me tell you what so-and-so said, or, you know, am I crazy when this just happened? You know, all of those questions, that imposter syndrome, all of that was re, re not necessarily, the word I'm trying to think of is it was comforted. It was like, no, you are not, you know, you are not crazy. You are fabulous. You are a great person. Um, and so I found myself needing that all along the way. Um, because I think in this society, we work, I think innately as black women, um, we have this level of perfectionism because we're constantly fighting against something. And so we want people to respect us. We want people to not feed into the narrative of whatever that negative narrative is. And so I think we exhaust ourselves for other people. And that's just unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's, it's crazy, really. It's insane um, to think that we have to be perfect. Um, we're not. We're not perfect individuals. And, and in addition to that, giving ourselves grace when we make mistakes or when we don't do things right, it's okay. It's okay. And that's why it's so important to have that community to reinforce that. And I'll, I'll, I'll get ready to stop there. But just the other day, you know, I was questioning taking on this other job. And um, I thought taking on this other job just innately would make me look better. You know, it would build my resume. And I went to my sister circle and I said, what do you guys think? I kind of gave them all the points of what it was. And they said, absolutely not. <laughs> you absolutely should not do that. Number one, because it's gonna take up extra time from you getting self-care and rest. Um, it's not paying you enough for your value. Um, and it's just not time. You said you had these goals and this is going in another direction. Absolutely not. And so for that, I appreciate that community doing it because if I were on my own, because there are times that perfectionism still creeps up, I probably would have taken that role and who knows where I would have been later on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I love the fact that you're mentioning that sister circle mm -hmm. and being able to touch in and look at how do you command your worth? How do you take a moment to say, is this what's best for my highest good? You know, right. will this serve, you know, my excellence, even in moving in Black excellence? Um, and we had the Black Femme Mafia when I was out in California. And we had like, and <laughs> that was all of our Black, like, queer, Black, lesbian, femme circle, you know, of like, we would go out, you know, in our freaking dress and do our thing and come back and be powerhouses on Monday, you know? <laughs> but yeah, but absolutely. But I love what you're speaking into. And I think that that brings me into um, both my next question and also a story. You know, I think the story that's coming up in my spirit as I hear you say that and what's resonating so deeply is what does it look like, you know, when we as women of color have to take, sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a saying that says, you know, it took me 20 years to be an overnight success. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a feeling of having to try three times, four times, 10 times as hard in order to show this is what I'm worth, in order to feel like you're qualified for the same you know, dollar amount, the same impact. And having to have that circle that says, 
hey, listen, you know, this isn't necessarily what is best for you. Um, even on the inside, there might be those questions that arise, you know, and, and being able to honor that truth, being able to honor that truth. And I remember a time period where when I was first starting Kumba Health, um, I was actually working at a, an LGBT medicine at the time. And I remember, you know, we were sitting in a circle doing one of those rounds of powwows. We were all checking in, you know, about what's going on. And I had gotten a call to do a presentation in DC. And it was my first one. And I was sitting there going like, oh my goodness gracious, I'm feeling like I'm bit bigger than this fishbowl. Mm. I'm feeling like I'm bigger than this fishbowl and, and is, is what I am currently making, meeting my worth of what I can really bring out into the world. And I remember not saying anything to that team, not saying not a word about the presentation to come and all about like healing, ancestral trauma and all of that, not, said nothing, went, had this whole big powerful experience with all people all over the world came and did join, came back to the very next circle the following week and said nothing about it. And within a week I was gone wow. because I had this, this revelation. That's how you had that sister circle. I walk with an internal spiritual sister circle, you know, as a minister and a psychologist of like, what does it look like yeah. when it hits you yeah. that the amount that you're actually worth is far more than not only the dollar sign, but also what you feel you're called to and your well-being, right? When you can show up be, and, and be imperfect and, and, and make such an impact and realize, wow, this is my calling. Yeah. You know, wow, this is my calling. And so sometimes that works and sometimes people choose to stay and continue to build. There's no judgment either way, whether whatever direction you take, but it's, it's about stepping into your worth and honoring that. So, you know, I want, I want to ask you, what is one way that you have seen people you serve or in your community struggle with diversity? Because there is a question sometimes that comes up of, will this work? Yeah, yeah. But all boys have been doing this for so long, they're not really gonna see my worth. Are you just gonna put a bandaid on it and, and move on? Right, yeah. there's a question that really comes up about how do we really get to the heart of some of these age old questions about worth? Yes, yeah. Will I be seen for my worth at work? Will I be seen for my worth in my circles? So I'm curious about how you show up in your, in your power, in perfectly perfect you, addressing some of these questions and misnomers about what diversity work is. Yeah, I, oh gosh, this is such a robust question. I hope I don't go on a tangent. Say, Please go on a tangent, we ready for it. I'll bring you on back, don't you worry. I just, you know. Oh, you know, doing this work, I, uh, first and foremost, is uh, very rewarding, but very challenging. Um, I read, I, I'm actually reading in particular right now, Ida B. Wells' autobiography. And gosh, you know, this is the late 1800s and she's talking about the same stuff I am talking about today. Mm -hmm. And while sometimes the needle feel like feels like it's moving, there are many times where I feel we take 10 steps back. And so we go back forward and then we go back. Um, but I recognize, I'm starting to really embrace this, that DEI professionals or people that are in these um, leadership roles are, for lack of a better word, agitators or reminders. It's not necessarily that you're going to make this huge change wherever you are, but you're going to be a reminder. What about this? Have you considered this? Wait, 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 wait. What's happening here? This is looking a little biased. What are you doing? You know, so that is how I see the role now. Um, I think we've gotten, hopefully, in many places, uh, past the, the training and just the awareness around DEI, because you can Google that now. It's Google, social media, go for it. So I am not in that place anymore. I'm definitely in the place of action. But I also believe that, you know, action sometimes happens quickly, sometimes it doesn't. But any, no matter what, you're just the presence sometimes of just this position does a lot for people. For example, where I sit right now, I think just being where I am, even if I don't say anything for my black women or my people of color, they can come to me and just ask questions. They know that there's someone there speaking on their behalf whether they're able to do it or not. And so that's where I see this position in diversity work today and now. I'll also add this caveat. Um, I believe that, and you were speaking to this on just your worth, you know, I believe that 
when the time is up, the time is up. And so these type of positions or this type of work, any work that is extensive and excruciating, and so you can apply whatever that work is for you, generally you should go into it, whether it's for profit, nonprofit, entrepreneurship, and look at your two to three timeline, two to three year timeline. Is this something that I want to do for the next two or three years? Um, and after that, what are my plans? Are, am I planning to move up in that role? Am I planning to build on this entrepreneurship? Or am I planning to move out of this role? Or am I planning to pass this entrepreneurship idea on to someone else? You should already be thinking about that when you get into this work, because it's hard. Nobody wants to be doing this hard work and then you're looking ragged at 70 and 80 with high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart attack, you know, whatever it is, overweight, losing weight. We, I don't want that narrative for my people. Um, we've done enough work <laughs> over these years. And so it's very important that you go into this DEI space if you choose to do that, um, really thinking about your end goal and not necessarily just for DEI, even for my women and men of color or any of our other identities that are underrepresented. Think about your value to that company. You were hired for a reason, okay? So you had some stuff that was great on the resume or in the interview. So you have what you need. Um, if you find yourself stuck in a hole or a place after having some conversation with a manager or HR, or whoever the professional is, and you find yourself that that person doesn't um, necessarily meet the vision that you have, you need to be asking yourself, why? Is this a place that I wanna stay and grow with? Um, I'm not saying entrepreneurship is for everyone. I think that's a great venue. And I think all of us as people should have some other things going on. Um, but that's not to your point. That's not to judge and say, if you decide to be in a career at a particular job, that that's wrong, but know your worth and your value because you were hired. Okay. You were hired to work for someone else's vision. So clearly you're bringing some addition to that. You're bringing some knowledge, some expertise. Don't lose sight of that. I think it's very easy to lose sight of that when I talk to some of my colleagues in this workplace. And so speak up, you know, give yourself a six month evaluation. You know, if you're doing the job right or well, and then after that, have a conversation and say, okay, what are the goals here? Because these are my goals. And if you find again, that that's not being met, it's time to reevaluate. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I love that. I love that the opportunity to do self-evaluations, team evaluations, professional evaluations. How are things moving forward and how can we see that across the board? You know, we, we're here at Pumba Health, something, we give something called a self-evaluation. It's like a worksheet where we're like, how can you reflect on where you are? Mm -hmm. You know, and I want to um, tease that out some more with you as we kind of begin to, and, you know, look at some tips as well for those who are listening. And if you haven't done so already, go ahead and check out AishaDBerry.com and go ahead and make sure that you subscribe below because we need to make sure that you are connected to this powerful experience and continuing um, to build upon your worth. So I want to touch, you know, tease this out some, you know, sometimes we underestimate the, the healing within what it means to show up as a marginalized person in an environment where you oftentimes feel like your worth or your intelligence or whatever it is, is being questioned. Yeah. And so if you are in a workplace where that's getting stirred, mm -hmm. I think there needs to be some mutual uh, work there, right? Mutual work around how can the community be addressed, right? bringing in an expert, bringing in someone like yourself to go, let's look at how the community can really unearth its worth so that they can leverage the strengths of its community and say, you know, we're not perfect, right? right? But our homeostasis, as I like to say, is off. How can we be better functioning? Right. But also doing the work where if you walk into the table and you begin to question yourself, mm -hmm. is it okay that I speak up? You know, is it all right that I ask for that promotion? Mm -hmm. Do they really see me here? Was that me or did someone just speak over me and say what I said and that was affirmed, but I wasn't, mm -hmm. right? Or even just looking at our ancestral rules, right? That at one point, your worth was based on literally you being perfect on the auction block if you are of African descent. And your worth is not defined by that. That mm -hmm. is not your worth, right? Whether you are desired on the outside, we're talking about desiring oneself, loving the body we're in, 
loving yeah. the choices we make, stress eating at the end of the day, stress shopping at the end of the day, all of those things speak to our worth. How are we investing, et cetera, like you're speaking to. So that also needs healing work where you would come and say, okay, work with Kumba Health and looking at how can you heal the history around worth so that when you step to the table, you know that you are calling in your worth 100% because you're worth that and probably more, yes. right? And probably more. So, you know, that's that inside outside work that I think is so powerful in relationship. And so I want to ask you, you know, if you can just give three ways that people can apply tools and they begin to notice that they either are questioning themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a person once say that they had stepped to the table and during COVID, they had a father who actually was lost due to a hate crime. And they didn't know how to bring it to their team to talk about it because they felt so isolated. And to be able to have courageous conversations around I know we're talking about safe spaces and everything, but this is actually really triggering for me, you know, as someone based on my history, right? Worth is so layered, yes. right? Do we feel worthy of bringing our voice up? So can you speak to, if you're asking yourself those inside questions around diversity, where is my worth seen? How am I valued at the table, even when I don't feel perfect? Or how is our team functioning in a way that honors the worth of those who are coming to the table? What are three tips that you would have or maybe um, a resource that you could provide mm -hmm. so that you're hearing this conversation and you're like, yeah, okay, that's great. But what are we going to do about it? Right. We kind of unlocking and stop a beloved to really unlock some stuff. Right. You know, right. What would you, what would be some, maybe three takeaways for those who are tuning in today? Yeah. Well, I think, and I think this is wonderful that you're talking about Kumba Health because the baseline I would say if you're able, and there are also free apps out there, is to start therapy. Yes. Um, and that could be on so many different levels. So I won't insert what kind of therapy, but some sort. And again, there are things like BetterHelp, the app, or Calm. If again, those are, you can't physically go to a therapist or you don't have insurance to do that. But I can't emphasize enough starting there because that's where the groundwork begins um, because if you build that that foundation or fountain up when things are like adversity or questions come your way you have a baseline of just some water in your vase if you will um, so that's that's really the first step for me I am a firm believer in community and having a friend or two um, someone that you can just talk to about things that happen, even practice what you're going to say or how you're going to say it, um, or how you're going to write it. And when I say that, you know, when you're in a situation, like you gave the example of your, you know, you're on a team and some things have happened to you personally, that is so critical. I think, especially as people of color, we are very ancestral and tribal by nature. And so we work as a unit. And some of that has been broken up over time as we've been here in the States with this, it's all about me, you know, it's all about self this, self that, and that's good, but I think we, we are missing at times this community focus. And so I think having a friend, a loved one, a mentor, someone that you truly trust to just say, what do you, you know, what do you think, how do you think I should handle this situation? I'm getting ready to say this, what do you think? Now, you know, let me say, you know, vet these people, you know, not just anybody now, but, you know, vet this person um, in terms of, you know, sharing your most inner um, and personal thoughts with them. Um, and then the other piece to that is finding if you're in the workplace. And when I say workplace, that could be a myriad of things, nonprofit, community organizations, entrepreneurship, all of that. But when you're in the workplace, finding an ally that has power and privilege. And I know that sounds crazy, maybe for some but sometimes in this work, you need someone else to not only be speaking up for you, but to be speaking up for others um, in the room. So finding that good ally, and that takes time because that means building trust with that person, um, really le le letting your hair down and really just hashing out some stuff like, look, this is what's going on with, you know, me and some of the other, you know, Black women in the office. And I'll just be frank. This is how I feel about this. And so... I am going to possibly say something, but what are your thoughts about it? 
And more often than not, I have seen my allies go into spaces that I am not invited into, and we're working on that, right? But that I'm not invited to that are speaking on my behalf when I'm not there. And sometimes that's how change happens. So again, I'm not saying rely on that ally, but that's another resource in terms of when you're really trying to affect some change and you find yourself spinning in a circle, saying the same daggone thing all the time, unfortunately and fortunately, it takes an ally to speak in that space on your behalf and then you walk together side by side. Um, but I, you know, I, can, I can't emphasize enough that foundation of therapy because if you don't have that, it's very difficult to be transparent with a friend or be transparent with an ally or speak on the things that are really bothering you and affecting you. Um, many things that you did not do intentionally, just being born here in America, yeah. stuff comes, okay? So, you know, I just think however you can do that, I urge you, it's almost like a critical, uh, you know, announcement, um, if you can consider that and do that more so than ever post-pandemic. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. So I'm gonna, recap that and reiterate some things that I've heard that I think are so important for us to take away. You know, so you spoke into allyship, yeah. making sure that you have this allyship so that you are clear that you are not burning out, trying to move a mountain that has deep, deep roots that you can't even see. How can you have someone who's going to be an advocate who's getting into those spaces that sometimes you don't even have access or know about, right? Number two, you spoke into having that friend, right? Someone else who you can kind of be a sounding board and say, is this me, yeah. right? Building on that. Now you mentioned therapy. So I'm gonna branch it off into two areas. One is if you are someone who has a history with a parent where sometimes you may need an inspiration to say, you know what? Actually, I had a dynamic relationship with my dad mm -hmm. and he taught me so much with my mom and you want some additional information about how to connect, or maybe that was lacking and you want inspiration about how you can be a stronger parent. Aisha has an amazing, amazing book and podcast that's gonna be coming out in the spring that I want you to tap into because there's some real gems in looking at how do we heal the ancestral messages, right? Of honoring our worth in the black family, right? Honoring our worth in the black church. And that took some healing to get into as a lesbian woman for me. So I can appreciate how for so many hearing your story around connecting to your dad may be healing for them. And I wanna build on what you said about therapy. And I 100% agree actually on the other side of the Goldman Sachs 10,000 entrepreneur program, Kumba Health took a pivot. And one of the pivots that we took was that we realized that there was a huge gap in culturally affirming therapists that could see you as either a person of color or someone who wanted to be an ally. Maybe you were diversity curious, or LGBT affirming, knew the language, you didn't have to explain yourself, or maybe you were spiritual and you definitely would have never gone to therapy. You would prefer to go to the, you know, the church queue before you, you know, or go into the imam before you talk to somebody, hello, right? right. That we now are able to, and we're launching a whole wing of Kumba Health. We're gonna be providing licensed mental health therapists and uh -huh. coaches who helped you to foster your well being while manifesting your worth. And so that's gonna be something that's gonna be launching in the spring because I saw that I, as a huge gap and me as one individual would not be able to reach as many as a tribe of therapists that we're gonna be starting to bring in. So, um, and they'll be specialized in mindfulness and telecoaching so anyone can reach out from across the country to be able to be plugged in FSA and as well, um, we're gonna to start to take insurance. So that is a pivot that, you know, I saw the need and I said, okay, to your point, Let's dive in. And yeah. while you're on your way to booking that appointment, pick up Aisha's book. Okay. Yeah. Hello. Okay. <laughs> Let's be clear. Let's be clear because healing comes in many ways. Sure does. That's right. That is so awesome, sis. I just want to send a shout out to that. I, that's amazing. I, I'm just excited about that because I see people beginning to embrace the idea of therapy. So thank you for meeting folks where they are. I really appreciate that. Absolutely. And thank you for the dynamic work that you do because what I have researched, Forbes says that the number one place that people often get stressed out is their workplace. And yeah. so for you to go in and say, how do I create courageous conversations so intentionally 
so that the very foundation that you're not bringing me back into your home yes. so that it's not in fact impacting your communication so it's not impacting your health you can feel that work-life balance because you're beginning to be that agitator that reminder that you spoke of yes. so Aisha you know, I don't know about you, but I am literally on fire. You know, the color of this beautiful yellow that you have. My, I am a glow, <laughs> all a glow. I love the conversation today. Yeah. yeah, I just appreciate, again, you know, just the opportunity. When I met you a few years ago, I was like, oh, yeah, I got to, yeah. this is this is someone I have to connect to. And again, this is, this is so important that we're having these conversations. I'm so glad that you have this platform because whoever's listening and you're struggling in your workplace and you feel like you're not being represented, look for that DEI person. You are not alone. You are not alone in this journey. You are not crazy. You are valued. You have the expertise. You can do it. You can do it. Tap into your inner self because you can do it because you're valued. If people want to hear your voice, they may pretend like they don't. They do. Because a lot of times they go and use your ideas, even if you don't know about it. So just, just know you are loved, you are empowered, and we support you. Beautiful. Exactly. You are loved, you are empowered, and we support you. So on that closing note, I want to thank you today for joining. I want to thank you, those who are tuning in, whether you are an executive a creative or someone who is just curious about how do you unlock unstoppable love in your life. I want you to remember that you are loved even when you forget because you are worth it. Reconnect to your worth, unlock the unstoppable love that is you, and just remember that everything that you do, you are the love medicine that is the answer to your ancestors' prayers. Thank you so much for joining today. Remember to subscribe below and look out for the next episode to come. Thanks so much, everyone. See you soon.